Welcome again, everyone. What we're looking into today is a new application of fuzzing, namely fuzzing at the API level. What does that mean? Very simple. So far, we have always assumed that the inputs that we generate actually uh, are being generated at the system level, which is we generate some big random input, feed, feed it to some program, and there we go. And of course, we also, also assumed that our input would be strings, even though these um, strings could, of course, represent arbitrarily structured inputs. And today, we're going to, going to explore another path namely generating inputs for individual functions, which of course is also something you can do with grammars. And um, this is a very simple approach, actually. It's also one of the older test generation approaches, also known as property-based testing. Namely, you have a generator for specific data types, and then you use this generator to generate uh, inputs <coughs> of this particular data type. Let us go straight away. These examples which I'm going to show, we are going to need the probabilistic generator grammar fuzzer, which is, well, the grammar-based fuzzer with all capabilities built in, such as, uh, <clears throat> such as uh, probabilities built in and generator functions built in and everything. So it's, just, uh, so it's just beautiful. This name is awfully long, probabilistic generator grammar fuzzer. At some point, we are reaching uh, Java-like uh, qualities such as whatever, a probabilistic gener generator, grammar, fuzzer, factory, facade, proxy, simulator, whatsoever. But we're not there yet. And actually, it won't get longer than that. I just wanted to, pre I just had prepared that such that I don't have to type all these long names in here again. Okay, and um, we're having a new module today, which is called the API fuzzer. And this API fuzzer, it's not even a class, uh, produce, um, gives us a number of uh, interesting grammars. The simple, simplest one here is the integer grammar, which we can use to generate integers. We can even take a look at it. Here comes the integer grammar in all its glory. An integer grammar, not very surprising, produces integers. And how do we know it produces integers? Very, very simple. We can either look at the grammar for some time, or we can just go and uh, generate a fuzzer which of course is a probabilistic generator grammar fuzzer. Oh, we need a shorter name for that. Can we call this the, the multi-fuzzer or the last fuzzer or something like that? Uh, okay, here we go. Oops, no, that was too long. Okay, fuzzer equals probabilistic generator grammar fuzzer and we give it the integer grammar as a parameter. Okay, here we go. Check, check, check. We have a fuzzer, that's great. Probabilistic generator. What did I do wrong here? Oh, it's oh, it's a fuzzer fuzzer. That's very interesting. I always wanted to have a fuzzer of fuzzers. That's a good way. That's actually also something that's very nice. So here we do have the fuzzer, and now we can actually go and uh, well uh, create a list of integers. Why not? Fuzzer dot fuzz for i in range ten, and we get and we invoke one is a bit boring. Ten. I say okay. Here we go. And we invoke the fuzzer 10 times, and every time it generates us a nice string with a number in there. Very simple. And now we can actually now we can actually go and uh, whatever synthesize a call out of that. So I can say I want square root, and I want my input of fuzz fuzzer dot fuzz. Here we go. There we go. Wonderful fuzzer dot fuzz, and I also need a Closing parenthesis, that's so great, wonderful. Now I have a call, and the call is square root of minus 82. This is going to be fun. Let's see what happens. If I, if I, if I do, Im, sorry, sorry, from math import square root. Hmm. No idea what's going to happen if I now invoke this thing here. Eval call. What's going to happen now? Uh, it's not going to work. We get a math domain error because our integer class, uh, <clears throat> because our integer class, also produces negative numbers. So we're simply going to going to continue until it actually until we actually get a positive number. And here we can now generate a call to the. <clears throat> now we can generate a call to the square root function. Um, besides integer grammars, we also have other 
useful grammars in here. We also do have a floating point grammar. Here we go. And then we can get uh, floating points. So let me get float grammar in here. Just should write import star. That makes life so much easier. And then I can produce arbitrary floating point numbers. Floating point numbers actually is fun because this also includes infinite numbers. And if you fuzz long enough, you're also going to get a not a number, uh, not not a number, uh, n a n uh, module in here. And besides floating point grammars, we also do have uh, ASCII strings, ASCII string grammar, and um, the ASCII string grammar. What does this produce? Not very surprising either. This produces strings. Happy in this. Happily produces strings as we have seen them before. And this is also something that we can now place into a function of our choice. So um, the idea now is that you do not only have these primitives, but you also do have, um, but you also can have uh, more complex generators. Notably, um, we illustrate that using a function which actually produces another grammar out of an existing grammar. And this is so in the list grammar constructor. So list grammar, what does list grammar do? Well, very simple. Um, list grammar is a function that gets parameterized with another grammar. And what this does is it creates lists out of this existing grammar. So now we're having a grammar which produces lists. Do you see that it produces lists? No, of course you don't. But if I make a grammar out of that. So I can do list grammar in here. And I can now again create a fuzzer. Here we go. Okay, just put this in here. And let's go and make a grammar out of that. There we go. Grammar, 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 grammar. We take the grammar which we have just produced. And we have to end now what we're going to get is a list of integers, if everything works well. Yes, so we get a list of integers. And of course, we can also generate a grammar that produces um, that produces strings, a list of strings, that is. There we go. Oh, uh, ASCII string grammar, actually. ASCII, ASCII string grammars, here we go. And there you go, and then you have a list of strings. One interesting thing, can we also generate a list of lists? That's something I've never tried before, but I'm curious to see whether this works. So now we get a list of lists of lists. Uh, no, this doesn't work. I am so sorry. You cannot simply create a list of lists. Okay, good. There's obviously a bug in here. We need to improve this further. But um, <laughs> we can certainly generate lists of elements and we can generate integers. And this allows us to feed arguments into all sorts of into, uh, into as arguments into all sorts of functions that we want to first. So if you have a function that accept, you can even go and uh, mine this automatically. You could go and track the in signature of a particular function, find out which argument which arguments it accepts, and if it's an integer, you pass an integer. If it's an if it's a string, then you pass a string. Um, the only downside is that you need an that you need a language in which the arguments are typed, and this is not always the case for Python. For Python, it's not always easy to see which type of argument which uh, type an argument has unless it's explicitly declared. And that's already all there is for API fuzzing. Not much more than that. Simply create a small little grammar that produces the element of your choice. If you want to have an object, you can create a constructor and all. And this allows you to feed arbitrary values into an API of your choice. Um, there are packages which are way more advanced than what we have here with grammars. Notably for Python, there is the very nice um, hypothesis package. This is a full-fledged library for um, uh, for property-based testing, for putting together even complex arguments and um, massively generating individual objects 
for testing of individual functions. And this is lots of fun. And um, so you can keep on working with grammars in particular if you need more complex grammar inputs. But also, of course, if you are looking for structured inputs, objects whatsoever, then please check out the hypothesis package for Python or uh, for Haskell, uh, there's the mother of all property-based testing systems, which is the QuickCheck package. So these are all very nice um, toolkits to work with and to th very thoroughly test your APIs. Um, a small story from my own um, <laughs> from my own experience as a teacher. Um, when I was a tutor at the University of Passau, we had programming exercises. And we had programming exercises such as, um, please go and implement a red-black tree. Red-black tree for you, this is fun. You can look this up in the Wikipedia. This is a very complex and extremely powerful search tree. Well, you've seen search trees such as binary trees, for instance, and red black trees are extremely advanced, um, advanced such trees. And um, like any search tree, these trees uh, support operations such as, well, searching, but also inserting and deleting. And since these trees automatically balance themselves, um, these insertion and deletion operations are actually extremely tricky. Again, look at the Wikipedia article on red black trees and you'll find that the deletion operation alone in pseudocode is something like um, 50 to 60 lines long. So a very complex thing. Good. So until then, we had tutors read the code of the students. So the students provided printouts of their code. The tutors would look at them. And then the tutors would say, yeah, this looks good. Well, it's fine. Good. And when we inherited that course, uh, we said, hey, you know, simply reading this red black tree code and uh, assuming that uh, this would work is not enough. So we set up uh, some uh, property based testing tool, which would generate a long sequence of insertion and deletion operations over a red black tree and see whether it worked. And it turned out there were, and then we ran this on the student code and um, yeah, none of the students actually had a red black tree that worked because well, that would work for one or two operations. But if you had say 10 insertion and 10 deletion operations in a row or interleaved in some way, there would, there would always be some glitch at some point and then they would fail. And then it turned out that, um, and then it turned out that it was extremely difficult to get all these to get all these data structures right. So we spent, so we as tutors also spent hours and hours sitting together with the students, fix, uh, helping them to fix their bugs. And this was, and in the end, we had a couple of working red black trees. In the next year, though, we simply gave um, students regular binary trees, very simple ones, but also had them but also forced them all to pass these property-based tests. And, um, and then and it turned out that even for simple data structures, having them pass all these property-based tests was a real challenge. And this is how we learned, also we as tutors, learned the value of testing or test generation or particular property-based testing. Because it turns out that if you do have a very good test suite, the demands for your data structures, well, actually, the demands for your data structures don't change. You still uh, are supposed to hand in an implementation that works. But even though the demands didn't change, the quality of the tests to actually uncover any issues was much, was much, much higher. And therefore, the demands also in terms of implementation uh, were much, much higher too. And it, that's when we realized that probably by far the largest majority of all programs that students had given to us in the past decades probably all were buggy in some way. And this is how we, this is how we get, to, this is how we became believers in systematic testing. And yes, use property-based testing 
to test your APIs, even with very complex data structures, and this uh, and the quality of your code, and the quality the quality of your code will will very much increase with all that. So, with that, that's all we have on API fuzzing. Enjoy looking at the chapter again, and thank you very much.